I was not planning on working on this video so soon. But you know what? Here we are. Revisiting Letterkenny Season 9. I think we all needed to catch our breath from Season 8's ending, but let's run a little recap. After being warned by multiple people to not miss Depp when it comes to Katie, Dirks thought it was a good idea to do just that anyway. So now Dirks is about to get his ass whooped. Or should I say that he did get his ass whooped? Boy, don't say you're sorry. My life's a safari. I'm drinking Campari. I'm playing Atari. I'm over you fast as a fucking Ferrari. Yep. I know all the signs and the signals. I know the tells. Cause everybody's always fucking somebody else. You wipe every single girl in the bar while I'm out for a piss. Only real men get this. Going into the first episode of season 9, we're actually told that the fight already happened and now we see the Hicks and friends all hanging out at a restaurant. I am kinda sad we didn't see the fight go down, but you know what? This episode's about to make up for it. So now the question is how? Well after Dirks got beat up, his cousins went looking for who did it. And after tracking the Hicks down to the restaurant, they're now looking to get even. Which one of you has beat the shit out of my cousin Dirks? That'd be me. That's how they do it in Canada then, eh? Eight dudes on one. Don't tip me with a good time. Yeah, I'd like to be fair, if there were other dudes there, you would have beat the shit out of them too, so. Yeah, the dudes are here now. Oh, shit. Oh, shit is right. So this is what it all comes down to then? Yeah, it all comes down to this, amigo. Time's up then. Oh, time's up, all right. Well, just give us a fucking minute, would you? No, no, no way. Come on, please. No, no, no not a chance. Please. Uh... Nah, forget about it. As we all probably could have guessed, the Hicks aren't faced in the slightest by the sudden situation that they're found in. To them, this is just another scrap. But before the fight begins, Wayne and Katie's cousin Jake shows up with some backup from his US military buddies, Johnny and Shawnee, who's also accompanied by some Canadian military buddies, Maddie, Patty, and Blaker. As for how they know the Canadian Armed Forces, they serve together overseas and have kept in touch with one another ever since. And by staying in touch, they mostly do that by going to each other's family's buck and doze and get military grade drunk together. So after their introduction, the fight officially begins and wow. It is very well shot. But there is one thing that I want to say here and that's how much better the fighting choreography has gotten compared to the previous seasons. I never really minded the clearly missed punches and such in the earlier seasons. To me, it was just a part of Later Kenny's charm. But especially in this fight in season 9, you can tell that they've been working on their execution. But onto the fight itself, all the guys are involved. Even Rold and Stewart, and I have to say Rold really surprised me. I don't think we've actually seen him have a go at someone, but in this scene, he is in full on assault mode. If anything, I thought he'd have a more pacifist stance like Stuart, but clearly not. So after the scrap, we cut to everyone winding down at a buck and doe. At one table, Stuart and Rold are hanging out with Johnny, Shawnee, and Jaker. At another, we see Katie, Bonnie, Mrs. McMurray, Gail, and Rosie. Katie, now single again, is eyeing Johnny as he is passing out a round of shots to his table. I know that look. Been that look once or twice was all my room. Katie's going scorched earth. Say what? By that, Rosie means that Katie is looking to have fun with as many guys as possible. At the bar, we have Wayne, Dan, Derry, and Mr. McMurray hanging out with the Canadian Armed Forces that helped them out during the scrap, Maddie, Patty, and Blaker. They're all awkwardly holding their preferred mixes of rye slash rum and cokes. Mr. McMurray expresses how hopeful he is that the skits brought some cocaine with them, but the group ends up telling him that they most likely didn't since they had to cross the border. A little bit let down by the news, McMurray takes his leave from the group to find a place to sit. You just mind if I dips Bonnie? She's likely already dips one of yous, bud. I feel like Gail would make a man out of me. Can confirm. Mm. Let's get hammered. Your terms is acceptable. So what are you into? Fucking chucking bombs and smashing moms, bud. Chucking mitts and sucking tits, buddy. Sucking tits? We see Riley and Jonesy and Mr. McMurray to the sea with the skids and the US military guys, and the conversation is getting a little interesting. After learning that Riley and Jonesy like sucking tits, Jake tells them a conspiracy theory about how that's one of the government's ways to ID you by your teeth. Huh? Why don't they just hack your personal dental records? Government skips a middleman. What say your body gets burnt up in a fire or a terrorist attack or else gets washed away by a tsunami and sharks eat you? It was dark. I love that. Your teeth are the only way to identify you. This is true. Teeth are the hardest and most well-protected structures in the body. They resist decomposition, high temperatures, and are the last to decompose once you're dead. At the ladies' table, we get a quick conversation to see if Katie has her eyes on someone, and also to see if everyone has called their dibs. Katie says that there's just too many guys for her to choose from. This being the case, she takes this opportunity to survey the area before deciding who she's going to go after. Dan, Derry, and the Canadian Armed Forces join the rest of the guys at the table and stumble on the topic at hand. 
So when I'm sucking a tit, I have my mouth wide open. Well, how do you do it? That's another area where the operative would have to encourage the target. Like, get right in there. How would they do that? It's a verbal process. Like, come on, suck my tit. Open your mouth right up and suck it, baby. Once Roll expresses his disgust for the unfair standards that the female operators have to meet, we get a little development from Johnny where he says that the male operators are not an exception. In fact... Most male spies get the camera up their dink hole. No! I might even have one up mine. I think I might too, Johnny. Oh, well that was a turn. The US military guys say that they all just assume that they have one up there at this point, saying that most likely it was put up there when they were asleep. Shocked at this, uh, revelation, McMurray asked the Canadian military guys if that's what happened to them, where Blaker is quick to deny it. Coming to the end of the conversation, everyone decides to get up and head over to the dance floor and find someone to dance with. However, while everyone is slow dancing, Stuart and Roll decide to take it upon themselves to change the song to dance music. Doing so causes a couple of people to gang up on them. Noticing what's happening, Wayne and company quickly come to their aid, but two stay behind. Katie and Johnny. I had a ton of predictions coming into this season after coming off such a hot season finale of that season 8 gave us, and honestly, I did not predict this sort of start. So here is my prediction. We were going to have a Katie-centric first two episodes where Katie was going to be down in a funk like how Wayne was with the first two episodes of season 8. Katie would then have to figure out what she wants from a guy, but ultimately decides that trusting someone else so quickly after what Dirks did to her is out of the question. With this being the case, Katie would then go back to her old ways with her primary motives being to find guys to hook up with. I guess for what it's worth, that's sort of what's happening here in terms of Katie deciding to move on with being single. But aside from the code opening, which was really good by the way, Katie seems on the outside unbothered and ready to get back out there. Of course I didn't expect to see her cry or anything like that, but I did hope to see a clear emotional shift from how Katie normally is to exactly who she has become after trying to give her heart to someone who she thought deserved it. Episode 2 kicks off at Modine's with Wayne, Rosie, and Katie having a beer. Dan then joins him at the bar top grumbling to himself. Turns out some kid stole his mailbox from the end of his laneway. Derry then also angrily takes a seat and says that some kids left a bag of shit in front of his door. Hearing both of their annoyances, Katie then tells him that when they were those kids his age, they used to do the same thing. Where they all defend themselves by saying, Allegedly. Next up to vent the problems are Roald and Stuart. Well, more so Stuart. Apparently every morning while the kids are waiting for the school bus, they're fighting and name calling. Now next up is Bonnie. Hers is more serious. You see, Bonnie's a victim of... Grab acid. Oh! But I can tolerate mailbox dealings. Yeah, I'll tolerate shit throwing. Worse things than fighting. I, name calling? The grab ass and young women's? That's where I draw the line. Something must be done. And something they will do. But before we get to that, Wayne is shown being oddly disinterested in this whole conversation. Rosie actually ends up having to tell Wayne that he's going to help after he at first says he won't be. As for the plan, the group intends to sit all the kids in question down and talk to them. Civil, right? Could any of us have ever expected the Hicks and friends to sit a group of kids down and teach them right from wrong? I guess if you look at it from this point of view, it does make sense why Wayne didn't want to go along with this. Sitting people down and talking things out has never been his forte. For any of the Hicks, actually. But they are dealing with kids this time, so I guess exceptions have to be made when it comes to determining the best course of action. They can't just beat up kids. It's gonna be interesting to see how well they do when dealing with teens. Moving on to Riley and Jonesy, Riley is shown being unsure on what to do next now that they've won the championship. This was a little surprising. Especially seeing how unsatisfied they were when they weren't playing hockey. Now Riley is questioning if he thinks him and Jonesy have done all that they can do in hockey. Luckily, before either of them have the chance to get two down while thinking about what to do next, the coach offers them a solution. Would you like to join my beer league hockey team? You're gonna love it. Oh. You in? There are so many awkward scenes in Letterkenny, but man, this one's up there. Now these are all down here today because he's been mailbox stealing, shit throwing, fighting, name calling, and grab ass. So what we've done here today is arranged a panel of local experts on this sort of thing to see if we can't help you sort yourselves out. 
The first to speak out of the bunch is Derry, who is very emotional. Derry tells the group of teens that he thinks the reason why they're acting up is because they have too much time on their hands. He offers the advice of spending that waste in time learning a skilled trade. Who is going to need their toilet fixed sooner or later? Answer, everybody. So get your toilet ticket. That's for plumbers and pipe fitters. People are always going to need to stay cool, so get your fridge ticket. Bet you don't like it when that phone runs out of battery, do ya? No. Get your electrician's ticket. This is so gay. Moving from that, we catch up with the beer league that the coach invited Riley and Jonesy to be a part of. For the most part, it looks like a fun alternative rather than just playing normal hockey. They're able to do three things they love. Play hockey, drink, and goof around. Taking a look at it from face value, there doesn't appear to be much wrong with this. However, there is a downside. As we probably could have guessed, the anomaly in this situation is the person who actually invited them to join the beer league in the first place. The coach. You see, when the coach is drunk, he gets a little... graphic. Hey guys, it's Ezra from the future, and it's 3am. So, because of the ridiculous amount of copyright claims I got on this scene, I can't play the conversation. So I'll just tell you that the coach is telling them a wonderful story about his sexual adventures with Barb over in the Blue Ridge Mountains. Alright, let's get back to the video. And I'll put what's left of you in a standard envelope and mail you back to your goddamn parents! After Dan's expressive lesson, up next is Stuart, Roll, Tyson, and Joint Boy. Stuart tells the kids that the reason why they're acting out is because they have too much energy. With this being the case, he tells them that a good way to spend all that bottled up energy is by fighting. As it's finally time for Tyson and Joint Boy to take over, they get into a little disagreement over what the most superior type of physical combat is. Joint Boy thinks it's boxing and Tyson thinks it's Muay Thai. I'd evade your straight on attack and knock you out. You'll be able to evade my eight points of attack and knock me out with your two points of attack? Also, too, your boxing stand exposes your knee. What are you going to do when I break it? Come on! I smell hot dogs! Meanwhile, it's Riley and Josie's first beer league game, and they seem to be having a good time. But there does appear to be one re-arising issue that kind of puts them out of the mood. You guys ever been to the Grand Canyon? Here's the thought, right? You Me really... and Barb parked the RV right beside that canyon, and we got so overtaken with its beauty. And then I took my sword, and I just, I took Camelot. Or was we called it Camelot. <laughs> then I was so tired, I just fell asleep. Barb, of course, went outside and washed up with the garden hose. Next on the list of topics is the most serious offense, grab acid. The ones taking the reins on this one is Katie and Rosie, with the intention of sparing Bonnie the humiliation of reliving it. Do you guys know what the sex offender registry is? Yes. Would you like to knock on this fella's door? Huh? Huh? A fella who looks like this? Huh? Say, hey, fella, I'm a sex offender, and see what happens. Rosie? No, Bonnie, Bonnie, no, you've suffered enough. So here's the issue. Katie and Rosie are strictly addressing the boys of the group. However, in this case, it was a girl. And to make things even more awkward... Why'd you grab her ass? It's a great ass. <laughs> but she did have one of those poop bags for dogs sticking out of her back pocket. I just went to grab it and hand it to her. Then she called me a skank. Our boys have officially finished their first beer league game and they're actually in high spirits. Even after another one of the coach's stories, Riley tells Jonesy if that's all they have to deal with, then Beer League is still worth it. For the final scene, we're back at Modine's with Wayne closing this little meeting. Wayne pretty much tells them that if they're looking to get involved with petty vandalism, to try something more creative like graffiti. As for fighting, he says to be careful because there's always somebody recording nowadays, and they'll be on the internet before they know it. As far as the name calling is concerned, he admits that he doesn't really care about that. But for Grab Hassan, he says that most likely the girl has a big brother, cousin, or dad who will be ready to get a hold of them. So he ends up by simply saying, Don't. Fuck. With girls. And now with that settled, let's hear what these kids aspire to be. You know what? I've always wanted to be an actor. I'm going to quit messing around and go do it. Well, don't fucking do that. Look how fucked up child actors get with adults pressuring them to entertain. You'll have a needle in your arm by the time you're drinking age. 
I'm going to be a climate change activist just like... Don't do that. Like, fucking imagine how fucked up child climate activists will get with adults pressuring them to save the fucking world. What are you gonna do? Get hammered? Carve my names into the bars? Make fun of skids? Fight this guy. Grab a big chunk of that ass. Well, sounds like we're gonna be young shitheads for a while yet, too. Episode 3 kicks off with Katie at a nightclub, accompanied by Bonnie and Rosie, continuing her Scorched Earth mission. The next day, she meets with the Hicks in her and Wayne's kitchen and tells them that she went on a date, telling them that it didn't go too well. The dude was... ripe. Is that what he was? A bit spicy. Like an odor. A smell. Yeah. Type of dude who smells like he wants to be left alone, eh? As the conversation proceeds, we learn that Katie is committing herself to only dating the locals. But as for what the rest of Katie's day is looking like, apparently she has another date scheduled. She wasn't kidding when she said she was going to Scorched Earth. This girl had scheduled a total of three dates all for the same day. Riley, Jonesy, Ron, and Dex are sitting at Modine's going over their cartoon takedowns until Glenn comes over to them. He tells them something a little juicy. Gail is out getting some of that good loving. But from who? Jimmy Dixon? So my guess was way off. Remember back in season 8 episode 6 at the end of the episode when Gail and the coach ended up slow dancing with each other? Yeah, I thought that was our little hint that something might happen between them. Jim Dickens was the last person I would have expected. But you know what? Good for her. As far as Jim's physical attributes are concerned, we do hear an interesting rumor. Is this all lying down as he is standing up? I heard that from the horse's mouth, but that's the end of this conversation. It's a three-hander, okay? But that's it. Goodbye. Glenn. Fine. We're done. We're done. And Bonnie enough. And we're done. Think Jimmy Diskin can, like, suck his own meter? And the small town rumor mill begins to churn. Back at the farm, Katie is now returning from her second date where she says that the date was better but still not good enough. The issue with this guy was that he had something called summer teeth. Pretty much, he was either missing teeth or very gap tooth or both. Wayne and the others say that they don't mind people with summer teeth. They all agree that as long as they are actually clean and have proper dental hygiene, it shouldn't be an issue. However, for Katie, she strictly prefers guys with straight teeth. So, <laughs> so, so, so. Joining our guys' table at Modine's are Stuart and Rold, and we learn that they also heard about the rumor about Jim Dickens and Gail hooking up. Rold admits that he's never thought about Jim sexually, but now he's starting to. After this, we then see how fast this rumor is spreading. I don't think we've seen a rumor spread this fast since the ginger and the ostrich, but we've lived to see the day. <laughs> Something tells me this is going to make its way all the way back to some unwanted ears. The small town rumor mill is a churning. I think I'd like to start going on dates, like Katie. Derry expresses his motivation to be like Katie and to date someone local, completely avoiding all long distance relationships. With this being the case, Wayne and Dan both advise that he should up his hygiene game before venturing back out. To put things more bluntly so Derry understands, Wayne tells him that he should finally change out of his barn clothes. Afterwards, Katie returns from her third date and takes a seat, saying that she needs a gus and brew. Unlike the others, this guy was a crotch scratcher. What kind of a crotch scratcher? There's more than one type of crotch scratcher? Yes. However, Katie says that this guy didn't even try to hide it. He just went at it. Soon after, they all get a text which suddenly makes them all want to go to Modine's. Sounds like they've finally gotten a whiff of the rumor about Jim Dickens and Gail. So at Modine's, we see literally everyone talking about the most recent developments between Gail and Jim. If we haven't learned from previous seasons, this should reinforce how close everyone in Letterkenny is and how fast news travels. Not too long after, the woman of the hour finally makes an appearance. I wonder if she's heard these rumors. No chance, right? Heard some talk that people been talking. Never mind. It's okay. I'm the first gal from town to take down Jim Dickens. He's always fancy girls from Donegal. Rev Curdy's referred to as a Donegal ripper. How big is Dick Skin? Know how I'm nearsighted? Yeah. Dick Skin got behind me at one point. His horn's so long. I needed my glasses to see what he's up to back there. Is it hard for anyone else to picture Dickens doing anything but fast talking auctioneering? Who said there was no fast talk auctioneering? Fuck off. Can I get a dip? One dip, da, da, dip, dip. Can I get an ass in there? I just don't care. I get a fucking get everywhere. So, 
Yeah, I think we get the point. Dickens got a good dick game. As from a developmental standpoint, I never would have thought we would have received this type of information about good old fast talking Jim. But you know what? Here we are. Learning something new every day. But no, this scene does not end there. Jim then makes his appearance and gives Gail some flowers and asks if she wants to go for a second round. The two then go off to have a drink. And from what Katie's just witnessed, she mentions how rare it is to find two people from Letterkenny who is together and happy like Jim and Gail appear to be. She then proclaims that there's no one dateable here in Letterkenny. No one new or exotic ever comes into town. Angie? Oh, please, do excuse me, eh? I've been abroad for so long I'm barely recognizable. It's no mean. <laughs> I barely even recognized her for a second. I drank nearly nothing but Guinness since Dublin, haven't I? Oh, do you take Euros here? And on to episode 4. This one is actually pretty hollow, so it shouldn't take long to cover, honestly. The Hicks and Rosie are all sitting around the kitchen table hungover. Now they're all hungry, but none of them feel like cooking. But lucky for them, though, Gail started serving brunch at Modine's. The coach runs into Riley and Jonesy, who were heading to the locker room to get ready for their brew league. However, he tells them there's no game today since there's not enough people to play because, as the coach puts it, Because it's Sunday morning beer league hockey, you pheasant. Since there's no hockey today, Riley and Jolie decide to spend their free time looking for some girls to hook up with. However, they run into an issue. They have used their normal dating app so much that they've run out of girls to hook up with within a 100 kilometer radius. So, what do they do now? Perhaps I can help. Who are you? Abby Goldstein, aka Golden Bombay. Hi. You ever heard of J-Swipe? No. It's a dating app just for Jews. Are you Jewish? Hold you, buddy. But we're not, we're not Jewish. Doesn't matter. You have the option to set your profile to willing to convert. Click that button, start smashing Jewish broads immediately. Really? Allow me to give you your judification. Jews clues bring you up to speed on Jewish broads and their people so that you can better navigate J-Swipe. Call me Jew Ferrigno. I'm Jew Barrymore. Follow me. Riley and Josie and Avi talk about their game plan for if they join the Jewish dating app. Avi's considering his helping them as part of his mitzvah, where he's required to do good deeds out of the kindness of his heart. So we're your mitzvah boys. Mitzvah men! Class is in session. Sick. Tight. Hype. Well. Inside Modines, the Hicks mention how different the brunch crowd is from the atmosphere we're used to seeing by now. It is weird seeing how drastically crowds can change, all depending on the time of day as well as what you serve during that time. Switching back to Riley, Josie, and Avi, we see he's giving them a crash course on Judaism. I do gotta hand it to our boys. Just for some quick flings, it's impressive to see how far they're willing to go just to get some. They're learning a whole new religion for this shit. And even better, they're actually retaining the information. So, you're honorary Jews now. When's your first mitzvah? At Modine's, everyone has finally finished their brunch. Rosie and Wayne are the first to leave, saying that they're going to go have a nap. Next to leave are Stuart and Rold, who leave to go play Super Mario 1, 2, and 3 on the NES while they do rips. And the last group to leave are Katie, Dan, and Derry, who go off to channel surf until they find one playing the movie Twister so they can watch it. After the three leave, Bonnie tells Gail how she likes the new brunch program because it allows them to close down for a few hours. After that, she takes this opportunity to join Katie, Dan, and Derry in watching Twister. Oh, no need to worry about Gail, by the way. Something tells me she'll be just fine. For the final scene, we see Riley and Jonesy entering the hockey arena with a bunch of kids. Abby runs into them and congratulates them on what he believes is them doing their good deeds for their mitzvahs. However, it's a little bit more driven than that. Sick. Tight. Hype. <gasps> so, there wasn't really much to this episode. The biggest takeaway is the launch of Gail's new brunch program to get her more business. This does hint at something bigger coming into play though. If they dedicated a whole episode to establish Gail's desire to introduce new things to Modine's, then there's bound to be a reason to it all. Starting on into episode 5 is another quick and simple episode. I will say before starting though that I enjoyed this one a whole lot more than episode 4. It's just a really cute ideal for an episode. So to get started, everyone appears to be having a game night. With the exclusion of Dan since he's with Ellen, Derry, Wayne, and Katie are playing Monopoly, the Skids are playing Sonic the Hedgehog on Sega Genesis, and Rosie, Bonnie, and Gail are playing Scrabble. As for Riley and Jonesy, they're just watching a hockey game. Do you want to know what we should do? 
I'll know when you tell me. Have at her. I think I know, buddy. We should watch all three jackass movies in a row. Oh! Watch all three Lord of the Rings movies in a row? <laughs> I haven't watched FUBAR in a long time. I've never seen FUBAR. Saddle up, youngin. Rock'em, sock'em, five. Not six. Five, then six? If I'm a bit tired, I might fall asleep. No, you won't. No, you won't. No, no you won't. won't. Let's hit the hair, press play, bro. Press play, buddy. There's no way we'll sleep. <laughs> There's no way you'll sleep. No sleep till Brooklyn, bro. Sleep when we're dead, buddy. Okay. A full-on Lazy Day episode for later, Kenny. This is probably the most relaxed episode that we've gotten thus far. It had this little nostalgic element to it that made me remember all the sleepovers that I had when I was younger versus to how I am now. Back then, my friends and I would stay up literally all night gaming. Where did all that energy go? But how Letterkenny is depicting them now? It is so accurate. You make all these wild plans to stay up all night, then you fall asleep almost immediately. God, adulthood sucks. But anyway, after we see everyone asleep, we go back to the Hicks where Derry still has a wandering mind. Wayne. What? Are you awake? Yeah. Is there someone that you like? What? Do you like someone? Are you sleepwalking right now? No, I don't think so. The memories, man. But the reason why Derry is asking this, even though he knows his answer is going to be rosy, is because he's wanting to tell Wayne who he likes. We then come to find out Katie is also still awake, and she asks if they know who the girl is. Derry confirms that they do indeed know her, so now that just begs the question on who he has his eyes on. But before he answers the questions, we jump to the skids. On the same topic, after Stuart wakes himself up by his own fart, Roald asks who he likes. He chuckles and admits that he does indeed have somebody that he currently likes. But before we find out who, he farts again, and then we go to the next sleepover. See the trend here? Moving on to Rosie, Gil, and Bonnie. Gail. Yeah. Did you just fart? Yeah. Uh, hi. Let's try to wake you guys up. Hi. So we can talk about boys. Oh, Gail. But yeah, Rosie's also awake. So now what? Oh my god. I just hit up Bonnie McMurray. I just hit up Bonnie McMurray too. I figured she's always been kind of lukewarm to the idea, so over time, I just keep taking runs at her. When's the last time you took a run at her? A few months ago. And they just circle back every few months. You could set your watch to it. You gotta put some work on that boy, Bono. Riley or Jonesy? What's the difference? <laughs> I oughta put a little work on him. What if I invited them here? You can both put a little work on him. And with that, Rosie decides to take her leave to go see Wayne. Back with the skid, Stuart reveals that he likes Bonnie McMurray as well. This now leaves only one person left to reveal who he likes. I wonder who he's gonna choose. Did you just say Bonnie McMurray? <laughs> yep, everyone likes Bonnie McMurray. Katie excited to hear that her friend likes her best friend, she offers Daria her wingman services to help secure Bonnie. And though Derry insists that Katie doesn't get involved, she has already texted Bonnie telling her to come over. Learning this, Wayne takes this as an opportunity to leave to go see Rosie. Little does he know though that she's already on her way there. As for Bonnie, Katie gets a text back confirming that she's also on her way. But... But Riley and Jones are on their way here. So? So two is better than one. I just want to snuggle. I don't. Guess you're gonna have to put a little work on him then, cousin. <sighs> But that's not the only thing. Roald encourages Stuart to go to Bonnie before it's too late and reveals that she's at Gail's house according to her latest Instagram post. We then see him take off on his bike to see Bonnie. However, riding down the road, he actually passes her while she's on her way to see Katie and Derry. Riley and Josie finally make it to Gail's to see Bonnie, but are instead greeted by Gail, where we end up seeing them shrug their shoulders entering the house anyway. Way to get a two-for-one, Gail. Now, as for what's going down at Wayne and Katie's house, Bonnie has finally made it over only to see that Derry has already fallen asleep. Damn it, Derry, you missed your shot. <laughs> and lastly, we have Rosie who's made it to Wayne. We see him just now tying his boots, but it looks like he won't be needing them for what they're about to be doing.
Episode 6 kicks off with the Hicks having coffee at the kitchen table talking about a breakfast joint closing called Sir Bill's. As for the reason why they ended up closing, apparently it's due to Modine's now serving brunch. However, it sounds like Modine's about to have some competition of its own. According to Derry, there's a chain restaurant opening up in town. A restaurant, as they call it. Yeah. Home of the short skirts and full bras. But aside from the restaurant opening up, the Hicks vow to be loyal customers. A small town like Letterkenny doesn't have room for competition, so Gail's going to need all the loyalty that she can get. At the skits, Stewart is back on his DJing grind is looking to come back with a bang by trying to play at the new restaurant. Just imagine all of the groundbreaking styles I can literally bring to the tables of the masticating masses beyond the standard land restaurantica. Riley and Josie are at the gym getting ready to enjoy some sandos, but they end up not wanting them after craving some from the new restaurant opening up. This causes them to get aggravated at what they had originally planned on eating and they throw their sandwiches on the ground. Bill, how are you now? Good, and you? Oh, no, it's fair. Okay. Don't love how quiet it is in here. We finally get a look inside Modine's and witness the effects of Gail's new competition opening up. And as we all probably could have guessed, this would hit her customers hard. But we learn that's not the only thing that the new restaurant has taken from Gail. They also poached someone from her as well. Oh, funny McMurray. I'm still working here, but I'm working a double today in two places. Judas. We've all got to make our paper, and I'm not surprised they poached me. I have more savoir faire than anyone in town. Dan asks if Bonnie really wants to work for someone whose main goal is to exploit their staff, where she says that they can exploit someone who volunteered. She makes it clear that she's only going there for the tips. It's nice to see that Gil isn't the type of person to hold anyone back from making more money elsewhere. The fact that she understands the circumstances and is willing to share Bonnie with her new competition is respectable. Rosie then enters and takes a seat next to Wayne and lets them know that they also tried to hire her, but she turned them down. As Stuart and Ro enter the restaurant, it's revealed that Mia Sophia is actually the one managing it. But as for the reason why Stuart has made it all the way there is to move forward with his plans to DJ for her restaurant. However, when Mia Sophia asks for his resume, Stuart scoffs and claims that he's the best DJ in Letterkenny and shouldn't need a resume. By the way, if you're wondering why those girls with Mia Sophia look so familiar, it's because last season they were the Brody models that were fired and replaced with Anique. In a quick scene, Riley and Jonesy are expressing their excitement for all the big city slams bound to be at the new restaurant. Afterwards, they take a little trip down memory lane about all the times they had hookups inside chain restaurants. Ron and Dax then show up and join Zen on the fun and tells them all the restaurants that they've hooked up with guys at. Huh? Gobbled cock at Manchu Walk. Straight up to Pulius at Orange Julius. You know I fuck guys at Popeyes. Ripped a double choco at El Pollo Loco. Raging bone at Cold Stone. Took it in the back at Shake Shack. Ever sucked willies at Chili's? As you can see, the list is pretty extensive. Gil expresses her unease about tonight's crowd. Rosie recommends adjusting by offering specials depending on the day, like she does for Wing Wednesdays. However, the idea of caving just to retain customers that's been coming around all this time angers her. I do what I do! My customers are loyal or they're not. I get where she's coming from. We're talking about the same customers that's made their way back to Modine's after it burned down multiple times. It's understandable why she's frustrated. But on the other side of things though, you could probably say the same thing about Sir Bill's, the breakfast joint that was forced to close due to Gail now serving brunch at Modine's. In a small town like this, you're always bound to be taking business away from someone else. But before we move away from this scene, I have got to play this hilarious topic about the use of the word taste. Real pervy about that word, taste. McMurray pervy, as I recall. It's just a word. You don't think it sounds a little bit pervy at all to say, and how are the first few bites tasting? Oh, yeah. Everything tasting to your liking? I see you've had a taste. How was it? Oh, yeah, you like how it tastes? Check, please. Stuart and Roll return back to Mia Sophia with some vinyl. She then tells them that they don't have anything that can play them, and goes on to say that she checks Stuart's online presence where she says that he has none. But, um, did you check the dark web? Listen, there are two types of DJs you hire in this business. Those who suck but bring people down, and those who don't suck and don't bring people down but keep people here. If you have big tits and experience DJing in the city, even better. And you probably don't even do mashups. Oh, probably looking for a little in XS Club 7. <laughs> Party Beatles. <laughs> After a little bit of small talk, Randy and Josie are the first customers to come into Modine's, aside from the Hicks, of course. They ask Gail if her kitchen is open. They then go on to tell them how crazy the prices are over at the restaurant. For example, their sandals would have been $26. 
But when Gail tells them that they could have just shared, they revealed that they had a strict no sharing policy. Godless motherfuckers. Next to enter Modine's are student enrolled, ask if they can play music, where Gail says that they can. As for the important bit, Bonnie McMurray! What it do, Chicky Poo? They caught me. Bit of a disaster over there, actually. They weren't prepared for the crowd. So everybody's leaving? You heard it here first. <laughs> Guess I'm working a triple. That wink. So my little theory here is that Bonnie and Gail had a plan in motion that would require Bonnie to act as a double agent. And while inside her competition's establishment, Bonnie would work quietly to guarantee that Gail's customers would come back to her. Now, what exactly did you do, Bonnie McMurray? And here we are on episode 7. Let's get into it. Wayne, Deary, and Dan are sitting in the parking lot questioning Wayne's decision on parking the farthest way from Odin's rather than up close. He tells them that the reason why he parked back here is to avoid drunk guys fumbling around outside and accidentally hitting his truck. However, Dan tells them the dangers of parking in the farthest away as well. He says that this is where the guys come to piss at and that Wayne is risking getting pee on his truck if he stays parked back here. <laughs> Choosing the lesser of two evils, he decides to park up front. Stuart. Bianca, don't forget. Stuart. I'm Stuart. <laughs> it feels like forever since we've seen Allie and Bianca, doesn't it? As for why they're visiting Stuart. I'm making a comeback. We're making a comeback. <sighs> You're gonna be DJs? DJs, fuck. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what are you called? I'm quite sure you recall our previous collab. Nope. The hottest sex imaginable. When? Now? No, 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 that was the name of our band. What are you called now? Connor? Darian? Tukak Shakur? Turns out the reason why they're so eager to get the ball rolling on Stuart's new image is because they'll be performing at Tannis' release party, which now bears the question on what exactly is Tannis releasing. It has been a while since we've seen what Tannis has been up to, which leads us to our next scene. Tannis? Damn, you two look good. Scorcher season, baby. Yeah. This is when Tannis' new business is revealed and we learn about Indian Energy, a new energy drink. She chose energy drinks after seeing how much people on the res were obsessing over bro dudes since their senior tournament, using that exposure to give her head start at getting her product out there. But Gail does make a useful observation. Looks a timbit like the bro dude logo, Tannis. And that it does. For a side-by-side -side comparison, here you go. However, Tannis doesn't think so, or at the very least, that's what she says. The others reinforce Gil's claim, but still Tannis denies it. The former bro dude models Tassie and Cassie comes over to Riley and Jonesy, revealing that there are boys as new ladies after running out of girls to hook up with. Figure it out. As Stuart and Road are nearly done setting up for their DJing debut under their new name, they take this opportunity to reveal it to everyone. Tukok Shakur. They just call us Tukok. Blasphemy. Sacrilege. We know. And degree. But... They're up to 10k SoundCloud followers. And you know what that means. Nah. <laughs> All aboard that train. In the bathroom, Tassie and Cassie receive texts from Riley and Jonesy asking where they are. Cassie asks Tassie if they should be Indian Energy Girls, with Tassie scoffs at being associated with what she considers as a bro dude knockoff. This gives them an idea. To get back on the good side of the bro dude rep that fired them and to also get their jobs back, they decide to tell the rep about Tannis' release party. Next scene, we see Tannis' party has started and she begins by thanking Gail for hosting the event. She goes on to mention her team's recent success and his current need for an official sponsor, this being her new business, Indian Energy. Tannis also reveals to everyone that she has officially bought the Eagles. Thanks for the heads up. This look great. Tannis? What's up? Your logo looks just bits and bites like the bro dude logo. Mm, no. Hmm. Mm. Tastes the same too. 
They all taste the same. Get your head out of your ass. They do not all taste the same. Okay, well then what are you gonna do about it, Aaron Brockovich? Besides sue the moccasins off you? You don't have to sue me to get them off. What's your sign? Hmm. I'll think of something. <laughs> Damn, you two look good. Let's go. Faut qu'on parle. Anglais, see what we plays. We need to talk. About what? We'll be back. Our first hint of trouble. So, a couple red flags here. First, the return of Anique. Second, the Brody rep's initial intention to sue Tannis, but then set of change of plans to find a better way to get back at her. And third, Anique's comment to Derry where she says that they need to talk, which means most likely there's more to be revealed that at least affects Derry. While we wait for the storm, everyone is having a good time. We learn that Tyson and Joinbury started their own beer league and that they've recruited Shorzy. We also find out that Tassie and Cassie are rather well acquainted with Shorzy after hooking up with him at our Halloween party. In regards to the lawsuit, Tannis and his posse express their worries, but she reassures them that it won't go that far due to how it would look to take down a First Nations mom and pop shop. It's a good point. But as we all know, that doesn't mean that she's out of options. And speaking of options... Looks like we're about to see what she's got up her sleeve. Before proceeding with what she has in store for Tannis, she tells Stuart that she likes his sound and tells him that they should talk, hinting at a possible contract deal with Bro Dude. Now moving on to Tannis. Would you come to sue the mucklucks off me? I said moccasins. Come on. Global Corporation takes down First Nations mom and pop shop? How'd that look? Mm. I like the way you think. But guess what I can do? <laughs> Hurt you. Much worse. In other ways. You sure? All your players are native? Read the Canadian Indian Act, all right? How about I read some Ancestry.com results instead? Riley, Jones, and Shore. Are they triplets or something? Oh, I just ask because their Ancestry.com results are identical. What? Huh? The direction said to spit in the cup and send it in. So we spit in the cup like the direction said. You spit in separate cups, right? Yes. yes. Who sent it in? Shorzy. <sighs> Shorzy! So since Brody Energy were the official sponsors for the National Senior Hockey Championship, the rep has the power to revoke their status as champions. Good luck building your brand on the backs of disgraced former National Senior Hockey Champions. JJ Frankie JJ is then called in to take their championship trophy since the Eagles are no longer eligible winners. The rep then approaches Riley and Jonesy and then asks if they remember when she said that the Brodu hat belonged on the head of a real athlete. To this, they say yes. The rep then takes this opportunity to reveal who she thinks fits that criteria. I have a new boyfriend. Oh? I wanted you to hear it from me. Kay? Katie? I have a new boyfriend. Oh? I wanted you to hear it from me. Kay? Yep, Dirks. As for Wayne's whereabouts, he's shown going outside and this is where we see he runs into Mary Fred. From my look at this season, it appears as if this was meant to be a calm before the storm type season that's meant for us to relax and catch up with our main characters. However, nearing the end of the season, we get flooded with faces we all probably hope we never see again. Every ex that cheated on the Hicks has returned this season, and we all know how they feel about cheaters. Now this begs a question on what could possibly happen next season. And I think this could very well go the way of the Hicks reaching their boiling points. Not only is the return of Anig, Dirks, and Mary Fred a clear issue, but to make matters even worse, they're all affiliated with a well-established company who is going after their friend Tannis. Cheating on them and coming back is bad enough, but for Anik and Dirks being directly involved with the company looking to destroy Tannis is going to make for an interesting season 10. As for Mary Fred, I have no idea what she's doing here. I didn't see her brother Jean-Claude anywhere, so it's still up in the air how I feel about her return. She did do us a solid last season telling Wayne what Dirks was up to, but I didn't think that there was going to be more to talk about after that. We can only hope that she's here to help somehow and not to be a homewrecker. Either way, I've got a feeling we're in for a wild ride. And that is actually where I'm gonna end this video. At this point, we are finally caught up on this revisiting Letterkenny series, and now it's time to finally get to work on some other projects. Until next time, I will see you guys later, and thanks for watching.